the Sex Workers Project Sacramento. <laughs> I also identify as somebody who's been a consensual sex worker for over four decades. I was, um, as they use the word now, trafficked for close to 10 years of that time. And for many of those years that I was a sex worker, I was engaged in, in survival sex. And I mean, first, before I go on, I want to define those for you so that we're talking the same language. There's a lot of terms that get thrown around, and as Maxine said, there's a lot of conflation. That's one of the problems we have, is people want us all to fit in a box and be the same thing, and we're not. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna define that. So when I said I was a consensual sex worker, and I used that term, the term sex worker is founded in labor rights. It, is, it has to do with the right to work. It's that belief that this is my body and this is my right and no one, and I mean no one, not law enforcement, not another person, no one gets to negotiate the terms under which I have sex but me. This is my body, this is my right, and you may want something else out of your sexual experiences and I so uphold that, right? But if I want to pay my rent, I should have that right too. My body, my right. So when I say sex worker, I'm talking about consensual. This is my choice, nobody's making me do it, nobody is coercing me, and nobody is setting those terms but me. Okay, I threw out another definition when I was talking. I talked about sex trafficking or human trafficking. Sex trafficking is a subset of human trafficking. And what that has to do is that has to do with force, fraud, or coercion. What that means is you as a laborer do not get to benefit from the fruits of your labor. Somebody else is making you do it. Somebody else is forcing you to do it. Somebody else is taking your benefits away. It's the same as in any other labor industry. We talk about forced labor in the domestic industry. We talk about it in the farm industry. This is the same thing. So when I talk about sex trafficking or human trafficking for the purposes of sexual exploitation, I'm talking about somebody who truly is a victim. They have no say, they have no rights. They do not get to benefit from the proceeds of their labor. I threw in a third term, and I use this because people always say, well, what if they don't want to do it? What if they have no other choices? What if they're made to? Isn't that still some kind of force of fraud or coercion? Um, I call that survival sex. I call that survival sex, and when we talk about and I'm gonna to talk to you in a minute about Stockton Boulevard and this 1.5 million and gentrification. So when we talk about cleaning up, that's what they say, cleaning up the areas, like those of us who end up out there are dirty. When they talk about that, what they are talking about is they are talking about attacking the most marginalized, those people who will not eat tonight if they do not engage in survival sex, those people who will not have a roof over their head if they do not engage in survival sex, those people whose children will do without, okay? So that's survival sex. So these are three distinctly different categories. Okay, so you heard Maxine talk about how the study's gonna conflate these, how they're talking about trafficking victims, but it's coming out of an organization that we have some worries about, that, that they won't be actually dealing with trafficking victims. Um, so I wanna talk a little bit about that as a survivor. Okay, I wanna talk about how I feel about that. I was out on the street for close to 10 years. I watched the outside world try to help me over and over and over, and each attempt made it worse because we weren't at the table. Nobody was asking us what we needed or what we wanted. They were throwing us in jail. They were looking at us like we weren't part of that community, okay? So as somebody who's a survivor, I have a problem with this study. Our organizations, the ones you're seeing up here, we represent people who have been trafficked and we weren't contacted. We represent people who are engaged in survival who are the most likely to be trafficked. We weren't contacted. That bothers us. There's another thing that bothers me a lot and um, that I wanna talk to before I pass it to our next amazing panelist. The other topic that I want to talk about is I want to, I want to address the massage parlors. And I'm addressing that because I not only worked in a massage parlor, but I worked consensually and I worked during the time I was trafficked. The massage parlor had nothing to do with that. My socioeconomic 
circumstances had a lot to do with that. Okay, but the massage parlor had nothing to do with it. Let me tell you the game that's played here in Sacramento and why this angers me so much. Because we go through these periods and we've been doing this over and over and over, decade after decade, and we act like we're cleaning something up or fixing it and then a decade later it's all back. Well, why is that happening? And I'm gonna to talk to you about the money flow. Because whenever when something doesn't make sense, I always say, look at the money, follow the money flow. So let me tell you how it works here in Sacramento. The city of Sacramento gets a licensing fee, or the county, depending on where that is. And so you go to get a license, and it's an adult license if you have a massage parlor. That license can be up to 10 times more than any other business in the surrounding area. So if you have a strip mall and you have 10 businesses, that one business brings in more money for the city than any other business. There's why the licenses are issued. But let me go further. It isn't just the business owner that's paying money to the city. Every person who works in there has to become a licensed massage therapist, which means they too pay a, a premium to the city. And I'm gonna say a premium because it's more than other business licenses. It's an adult license. So those are cash cows for our city. That's how come they open so many. When the city has problems, or the county, like I said, where, where it's located, what they do is they begin opening them like anything because they get a large amount of cash flow. That's not where the cash flow ends. Each time a new person comes to work, they get another license. Boom, boom, boom. And the fees stack up, they get more and more money. And then what happens after a while is the community members look around and go, oh my gosh, there are all these massage parlors. How did this happen? We need to shut them down. Okay, so let's talk about the money on the way out. Okay, usually the way they get the money on the way out is they find them. They go in, they do raids. They find not only the owners, but they find the workers as well. And most of the time, those workers, those ones that they say they want to study, they want to help, are arrested. Okay, I myself was arrested while I was in a situation of exploitation. I was the one that went to jail, not anybody exploiting me. So once again, the thing they say they want to do to help us is not going to do that. In fact, it's going to have an adverse effect. Those massage parlors are businesses, businesses where people are engaged in survival. They need the jobs. All you're gonna do is make a bunch of people unemployed. The people working out on the stroll are engaged in survival. If you take and run them off a street where they're lights, where they're people that they know, where they're in their own community, they are only gonna be pushed to a different street corner or an alleyway where nobody can see them. I myself had that happen. I myself had violence that happened that almost took my life because of such techniques that the law enforcement uses. So, I'm not just saying this because I read it. I'm not just saying this because it's a personal opinion. I'm saying this because I've watched this happen to myself and my friends for decades, and it's time we do something different. Right?